station. This is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Houston, I am ready for the event. National Park Service, Service. this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is Ray Savasho with the National Park Service. How do you hear me? Ray, I have you loud and clear. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. This is a really exciting opportunity, and I'm so pleased and excited to be speaking with you in the International Space Station. Um, I understand that you are a very big advocate and fan of national parks and maybe displaying that, uh, that admiration right now with your, uh, with your outfit. But um, before we go too far into national parks, we're all so curious here on the ground, how fast are you traveling and what part of the world are you currently over now? Well, the International Space Station travels about five miles per second, um, so that would get us from California to New York in about 10 minutes, and we get all the way around the world in about 90 minutes. Right now, uh, we're over the Atlantic Ocean. I have a, a mapping program that tells me we just um, passed over Central America and we're over the Atlantic Ocean. Wow, that is amazing, and that is, that is quite, quite a rapid speed. Can you describe your mission and what a typical day is like on the International Space Station? Sure. Well, basically there are seven of us living aboard an orbiting research laboratory in low Earth orbit. And we conduct, uh, during the six-month stay up here, we'll conduct hundreds of science experiments, and um, as well as technology demonstrations, as well as um, basically keeping the space station in working order. So on a given day, uh, we might be hands-on an experiment that's very involved, or we might do something where we're just changing out cartridges for an experiment that's being monitored by investigators on on the ground. We also, as I mentioned, we have technology demonstrations that are ongoing, and so those are technologies that help us um, here on the space station, such as like water reclamation, will also help us in our exploration missions going out uh, to the moon and onto Mars, but technologies that can also be used in remote areas on Earth where maybe folks don't have access to clean water all the time. So um, that's another example of the kinds of things we do up here, plus maintenance. So on any given day, you might be doing some plumbing or some electrical work or some mechanical work, so it kind of covers a big spectrum. That's really interesting. It actually sounds, um, in, in, a, in an unusual way, not too dissimilar from some of the activities that go on in our national parks with um, all the various activities and diversity of responsibilities that occur um, to both take care of the, the, the space station, but as well as take care of our national parks. We're so, so grateful for the photos of parks that, that you have taken and you've shared from both the Space Shuttle Atlantis as well as from the International Space Station. They provide a, a truly unique and fascinating view of the national parks. And as you know, the national parks protect amazing landscapes, everything from deserts to uh, high mountains to vast wetlands. Um, what is it like observing these places from space? Can you actually see them and can you make out the, the characteristics and the features of, of some of these national parks? Well, Ray, I'm so glad that people are enjoying the photographs. It's been a really great hobby for me, a really engaging hobby, to teach myself to spot the national parks from space and then teach myself gradually to take better pictures of them. Um, the different parks, of course, they're all different, different sizes, different kinds of features. Um, but yes, you can absolutely spot uh, the characteristic features from space. Some are very obvious, like the Grand Canyon. Um, some are less obvious. And so what I have done is gradually you know, go over an 
area and I can pick out you know some of the big features and then as we go back over those areas in, in, in ensuing weeks uh, learn to spot the features that can direct me to really find some of the smaller areas recently we had a beautiful pass over the southwest and I've, I'm just gonna start sharing the pictures in the next week but I saw Joshua Tree and Zion and Bryce Bryce was really hard for me to find and so you take a whole bunch of pictures and then I go back and look at them and compare them to a mapping program and teach myself to find some of the characteristic features so it's really uh, like I said it's a compelling and engaging hobby and I love you know thinking about the parks and and hopefully planning some uh, some more trips for the future when I get home that sounds absolutely incredible. I know I find myself trying to do the same thing when I'm flying in an airplane uh, looking for features that I might recognize, uh, but I can't imagine what it must be like to do it, to do it from space. Hey, in addition to some of these natural features and these um, amazing landscapes, national parks also protect uh, examples of our history and our cultural heritage. Are you able to see some of these smaller features, like, for example, the Gateway Arch in St. Louis or the Statue of Liberty in New York Harbor? Well, those features, as you can imagine, are much harder to spot real time. Um, you know, as you know, going, we're going five miles per second, so it's pretty tricky. <laughs> One of my crewmates um, really enjoys taking city photography, and so he takes some really uh, magnified pictures. So we have a couple different of the kinds of cameras that we use. Um, he'll take pictures of cities with uh, cameras like this one, and he has gotten an amazing photograph that shows the gateway arch, even showing the um, shadow of the arch over the river, which is just incredible. I tend to take photographs. Um, that are wider area, um, and maybe I'll graduate to a camera like this uh, later on, but it takes a pretty steady hand. Um, I tend to use a camera like this so I can get a wider area and then zoom in as I start to identify different features. That's great. It sounds like it's a, um, a, a, a lot of a lot of fun, but also, like I mentioned, it's really, really an important and, and helpful uh, thing for us to see here on the ground, too. So that's, that's great. So it sounds like you've um, seen some of the, the Southwest parks recently. Um, when you see national parks, uh, are they, you know, do they stand out? What do they look like um, uh, compared to the surrounding landscape? Is this something that when you look at it, do you, you know, perhaps if you didn't know it was a national park, would you say, wow, that's an amazing, amazing place. I wonder what that is. Do they stand out in the landscape? Uh, they absolutely do stand out in the landscape. They're generally, they, they very much draw the eye, again, especially like the Grand Canyon, but even the smaller um, the smaller parks. I first noticed Zion just because my eyes were drawn to the incredible pattern um, that that area makes, you know, viewed from, from 250 miles up. And so um, I took all the pictures and then I tried to figure out what it was and thought, oh my gosh, that's, that's what Zion looks like from space. How amazing. So they absolutely do stand out. Um, generally, uh, you know, some of the larger parks, of course, are away from populated areas, but some of them are much closer. And so sometimes you can define the, the park boundaries almost by seeing the, the interstates going on on either side of it. So you start to learn the, kind of those different ways of recognizing the, the parks as you go over. Excellent. Yeah, I bet it gives you sort of a, a vivid display of, in some ways, the importance of having these, these places set aside so that people can continue to enjoy them um, along into the future. I wonder also, when you see a park from space, um, how does that resonate with you for parks you may have visited on the ground? Does it look very different, or are you able to kind of make a connection um, based on an experience maybe you've had on the ground, or when you're up in space thinking, oh, yeah, I, I, I can kind of imagine what it was like when I was at that park? Um, I think it's absolutely all of those things, Ray. There are, um, it, basically it brings back a lot of great memories for parks that I have been to before, such as Yosemite, you know, my parents taking us there as, as teenagers and really kind of falling in love with the great outdoors at that point and knowing that hiking and backpacking and camping was gonna be always part of my life. Um, you know, Grand Canyon with my college roommate, uh, Zion with my grad school friends, Yellowstone, um, both in the summer and the winter with my husband. These are amazing, breathtaking places. And and the more, um, the more I see them up here, you know, I, I have those memories. And, and also then seeing parks I haven't been to before and thinking, oh, wow, that looks amazing. You know, I really want to go there. I want to learn about that environment. That's great. I know um, uh, certainly when I've visited parks, uh, both uh, 
as a child and growing up with my family, but even now recently in my work with the National Park Service, one of the incredible things to do in parks, and this is actually one of the most uh, rapidly expanding areas of, of activity and enjoyment by people visiting parks, is to use parks as a place to see the sky, to use it as a window um, to the sky and particularly to the dark sky. So national parks have become, in many places, these magical places to view the night sky that is becoming, you know, much more difficult to see in other places with more, uh, more lights and uh, more urban areas. Uh, so it's become a great venue for introducing people to um, the amazing things that you can view above, uh, to viewing space, to viewing stars, um, and to learning about things like um, astronomy and what we can learn from space about the Earth. What would you um, suggest to people that want to learn more about the night sky and how might this be a good way to um, excite people about um, space exploration and learning about astronomy? Well, I think you're absolutely right, Ray. Looking up at the dark sky from parks, um, I think a lot of people, when they spend their lives in cities or near populated areas, they have no idea just the sheer numbers uh, of stars that are out there and, and other features as well. And you can start to th see things that you couldn't imagine um, when you're out at the parks and, and in a dark area. So I think, you know, the, the advice I would give people is follow your curiosity. When you've seen something that astonishes you, you know, make the effort to try to figure out what that is. And so for me, I love learning from books. I, I love to read books. Um, I get library books all the time. And also museums. If, if sitting down with a book is not your thing, there are lots of great museums that can start to teach you the basics of astronomy and, and help you follow your curiosity um, down some of those paths. And of course, there's tons of online resources. NASA has some great resources. Um, there's a, a, a video series called What's Up that kind of tells you what you can see in the night sky that month. And lots of great lesson plans as well for folks that are trying to maybe, um, for education who would like to start an astronomy unit with their with their um, students that is great that sounds like a, a really amazing um, uh, partnership and relationship that that we in the national parks can have with um, with you up in 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 space and with uh, with NASA to help uh, provide um, the window from national parks, but then the information and the educational opportunities that people can experience when they're in national parks um, looking, looking up at the sky. Um, speaking of the um, seeing national parks from the International Space Station, I think national parks also provide uh, an amazing place to look for and, and, and perhaps even see the International Space Station. Have you ever seen um, the station from, from Earth or even from a national park? I have definitely spotted the space station many, many times, uh, also while camping, probably so many times that I can't remember specific spots. I'm usually uh, you know, out in a parking lot somewhere, waving and hollering at uh, my friends and colleagues as they go overhead. So anybody can do that. You can go to spotthestation.nasa.gov and put in the, the town where you are, and it will tell you when you'll have some uh, good sighting opportunities as we go overhead. So um, I encourage people to do that. It's amazing to see. Um, it's a very bright object moving very fast across the sky, and I think it's, it's really neat to see. Even if you're in a more populated, lighted area, you can still see it. That's great. Well, I think that that will be uh, something that we can, we can highlight to people uh, as they come and visit national parks. And uh, it sounds like we can get information also about, you know, how and where and what, what are best times and so forth to see the, see the space station. So yet another thing that people can do when they visit national parks, um, enjoy the night skies, look up into the sky, and then see the International Space Station. Um, I think it's so amazing to think that, you know, you and others are up there looking down um, and appreciating all these wonderful, wonderful things that are on Earth and particularly um, the national parks and what they have to offer. Um, can you share maybe some favorite national park experiences or memories, um, things that may link to your kind of interest and excitement um, as an astronaut as well? 
Well, one of uh, one of my great memories um, in national parks, I have I have lots. Um, one of them is uh, a, a trip that I took in Canyonlands with fellow astronauts and cosmonauts, and we do that um, to practice what we call expeditionary behavior. So we're all explorers, and I believe that people that enjoy the outdoors, that enjoy backpacking, are also explorers, learning about the the natural areas. And so we spend time in these wilderness environments to challenge ourselves um, to learn not just about the natural environment, but to learn about each other and how we work together as a team, how we can be leaders uh, for a, a high-performing team, and uh, challenge ourselves to, to accomplish a goal, which for us was you know hiking across a section of, of Canyonlands. And so that was a wonderful set of memories um, where I really learned a lot, discovered a lot about myself and about my crewmates and teammates. And I think those those kinds of experiences lots of people have when you when you go backpacking with a group of friends. I think it's all about exploration and about growth. So I think um, all, we have all of those things in common with folks who love the parks. Uh, I think most uh, astronauts would say that they love those kinds of outdoor activities as well. And then uh, one more, probably the most special experience that I've had a uh, national park. My young son took his very first steps in a national park, which was Lassen Volcanic National Park. So that will always stand out for me in my mind as, uh, you know, kind of launching our little explorer on his, on his many adventures. Wow, that is great. That is a great Great story. I know Lassen is actually one of my favorite parks. I visited as a, as a child um, as well with my family. Well, I love your description of, of um, park visitors as explorers. I think that's a really, really good uh, uh, way to uh, describe people that come to parks because they are, in fact, exploring our natural environment, our natural heritage, but also our cultural and historical um, heritage. So they are exploring these things for themselves and on their own. Um, and uh, in some ways, they're kind of doing what you all are doing as um, space explorers. I love that. I love that. Um, that comparison there. Um, I understand that you also are a, a, a marine scientist. Have done work in oceanography. Um, uh, national parks, of course, include amazing landscapes um, in terrestrial areas on land, but there are also uh, 88 ocean and coastal parks in the national park system. Uh, have you been able to pick out any of these coastal areas uh, and the coastal parks, and what might they look like from space? They look like from space? That's a great question. That's a little bit trickier to do, but something that I've been talking with my crewmates about how to um, spot and then how to photograph some of these kinds of features. So it's something that I hope to do going forward. Um, but right now, I'm, I'm still focusing on the things that I can easily pick out kind of real time as we go flying by. Excellent. Well, we would love to uh, uh, do our best to help you out in finding the parks and keeping up this, this great uh, hobby and the information and uh, images that you're able to share have been so, so um, exciting, interesting, and valuable for us. So thank you so much for that. Um, this has been a really great opportunity. Um, I've so much enjoyed talking to you. It's such a great uh, a, a great opportunity to be able to uh, think about and hear somebody describe national parks from such a unique and different perspective. So thank you so much for this. Oh, you're so welcome. And let me just return the thanks to you and to all of the members of the National Park Service, to all of the staff and rangers and educators and people who preserve and our natural areas and, and then and educate us, the rest of us about them. It's a, it's a wonderful thing that you do. Um, it's a wonderful gift to everyone in the country and really visitors from around the world I know come and come to the parks. And so it's really, it's very important, the work that you all are doing. And I'm so grateful for that as well. And I'm glad that we made this connection. Thank you so much, and um, I hope that this also inspires people to not only be excited about space exploration and what we can learn from space, but to make the connection between space exploration and becoming an explorer of our national park system, too. And I think that that would be, that would be great if we can help inspire people to do those things. I certainly agree. Thanks for uh, visiting with me today aboard the International Space Station. And don't forget to wave uh, when I fly over. Absolutely. I look forward to doing just that. Station, this is Houston ACR.
Thank you. That concludes our event. Thank you to all participants from National Park Service Station. We are now resuming operational audio communications.